have to be on video? Or is this something where it can be off video? Um, and um, sometimes I value being off video because I have Zoom fatigue. Um, but if I'm on video, then I prefer to be in a place where um, it is really meaningful for me to be on video. I'm not just a passive um, listener to something, but I'm actively communicating with people because then it's worth being on video for. Um, so just a question, how did it feel um, as you were coming in and you know, having this connection exercise? If you wanna unmute yourself, um, how did it feel for you personally? I'll jump I'll in. Go. Oh, go oh, ahead. sorry. Go ahead, Lindsay. <laughs> oh, well, I guess just for me, I'm definitely more engaged when I'm asked to put my video on. And so I've been attending these sessions today and just having my video off just so I can, you know, pay attention and take notes and whatnot. But um, I'm more engaged and I guess more interested, right? When the instructor says, please turn on your video. I want to see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, as you've probably heard, um, the video like video on off um, is, is indeed an equity issue. And you probably noticed that I didn't force you to put on your video. I, I invited I invited you to put on your video. And that also is part of this compassion, understanding if for whatever reason someone ha wants to have their video off. Sometimes I can listen better. You know, when the video is off, I can focus on the words, you know, rather than than the images. Thank you, Lindsay. And you had uh, something to share. Well, it's also nice to see faces behind the names, because especially, I mean, it was nice to see people I know. Hi, JC. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of new people. And if you only see the name, you have no idea who they are. I mean, I still actually don't know who you are, but I feel like I do when I see you. Right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. I, it, I love that phrase. I feel like I do when I see you, right? Just um, just seeing people, um, seeing them nod, seeing them smile, that does help indeed with, uh, with the connection. Absolutely. So as you probably saw from, uh, see from my second point, um, I come a little bit from philosophy, um, the I-thou relationship from the theologian Martin Buber. Um, in an I-thou relationship, it really is, we are relating to a thou, a thou with, in terms of Martin Buber's idea, um, the thou has the spark of the divine. It's not just an it, an object that we are interacting with. It's not just transactional. Um, it is a deep um, relationship that, um, that we have. Um, just out of curiosity, um, as you went online or as you are um, interacting online, do you sometimes feel things seem very transactional and I it relationship? Yeah, I see some. I see some nods. Um, yeah. So in email, sometimes that feels like an I it relationship. Um, so. What I, in, in my talks about compassionate communication online, um, I, um, I encourage people to listen to understand rather than listen to speak. And that's indeed, it's a learned skill. It's not something that we are primed to do uh, because uh, we've been taught from early on um, especially in American culture, uh, we've been taught from early on uh, in order to present ourselves, to listen so that we can speak, so that we can have, um, we can have our voice be heard. That, of course, is important, and it certainly has a place. Um, but listening to understand helps with the I-thou relationship. Okay, so now what does this mean for communicating with students? Um, and for this, I'd like to invite my, my co-presenter again to talk about kind of his strategies um, as, uh, as, you're, as we've been talking to me about, you know, about, the, um, about relationships uh, with students um, online. What are, the, um, what are the lessons that you've been learning? Well, first of all, the, the, the lessons, so again, going back to these large classes that are sort of 
traditionally structured in a relatively unempathetic way, non-relational way. Uh, I, I found the COVID time and actually a perfect time to, to try and reinvent these classes and to try out um, pedagogical risks. So, so some of the strategies that I use in, in in-person experiences as students come up and, and often are, are primed for a conversation that's in a relatively demanding mode, for example, um, asking for something really specific. It's, it's hard for me, you know, being trained in this, this background that, that you mentioned, Ivana, to, to on the fly come up with a response that would be more empathetic, more relational. And I found that, that given, in a sense, this, this odd distancing we have online, uh, particularly through Canvas and in, in sort of text-like environments, I'm able to pause and delay and really think very carefully through my response. Because you said, as you said, it's a, it's a trained um, response and it's not something that I have been familiar with. So I actually, as, as I, it, it takes me a long time to write very careful emails that are, that are much more positive and empathetic. And I know that sounds strange. It's just not my natural skill. Um, but when I do that now, it's, um, I'm able to save them and, and, and use them as examples and, and for later conversations. And for me, oddly, um, using this dis distancing technology has helped me in some sense become more empathetic and closer to students. Um, so I literally now have examples of writing that I can use, that I can bring in to help launch into a conversation. And I found with, with students, um, one really specific example in my classes now is I used to be very, um, very strict about my deadlines. If something was late, that was it, unfortunately. You know, especially in large class, who can manage all these, these you know, delays and so on. And now with Canvas, I'm able to use, use the technology to very quickly see, did people turn in things? If they didn't, then I can nudge them. And I nudge them with responses now. I don't call them out or I don't do a more sort of um, very rushed email saying, hey, your stuff is late, please turn it in. I actually uh, say, you know, I know things are really busy. I just wanted to check on and see how things are going. Um, don't worry uh, about being a little late on this assignment. There's only a small penalty, for example. So what I do is I, I phrase it in a certain way, I phrase it in an understanding way, but I've also, within Canvas specifically, I've adjusted the grading uh, structure uh, using um, Ivana's guidance, so maybe she can talk more about the details about this, to basically only take a small amount off of a late assignment and then have a baseline that actually is, is uh, at 50%. So even at the end of the semester, if they missed an assignment at the very beginning of the semester, they can still submit something and get half points right there. And in the old days, it would have been, you know, you're three days late, that's 20% per day, boom, it's forget it, <laughs> you know. And it was just a rushed sort of grading strategy having to cope with a large class. But now I can use some of the automation that Canvas provides to actually be a little bit more supportive and empathetic of the students. And I know that sounds, you know, sort of odd, but in a way, um, with Ivana's guidance, I've been able to take advantage of some of these tools to be more supportive and then focus on the individual student. And now when I send out those messages saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing your discussion. Uh, don't worry about being just a little bit late. My nudge comments, inevitably, immediately, I get a third of those students, if it, let's say it's a large class, 100 students, and maybe 10 of them were late a third of those 10 will immediately respond and say, oh, I'm really sorry, I, I just forgot, I'll get right on it. And they turn in their thing immediately. Whereas in the past, that wouldn't happen. And then a day or two later, another third basically chime in and they describe uh, the con what happened. Um, so they're trying to explain what was going on. So I get much more interaction and empathetic interaction with students and I get the work and they move forward. So it's a much more positive experience um, for me than it was pre-COVID and pre-using um, the LMS appropriately, I would say. I think so, I, I love I love that point about that it's um, that it also feels better for you. Yes. To um, to communicate um, in this way, um, mm -hmm. so the the kind of strategies that Julian was kill, uh, Julian was talking about um, are um, are things that. Um, that I had to learn when I went um, online. It's not something that came to me naturally. And I wanna explain like why, why that would be the case. And so I'll share my screen again. Um, and then we'll go into um, an interactive session.
Um, so when you look at this graphic, um, traditionalists versus warm demanders. Um, so Kleinfeld uh, in the 70s, I mean, that seems like many eons ago, but in the 70s, um, she came up with um, this uh, expectations versus relationship graphic that has helped um, explain to me where I was and where I had to go in order to be compassionate. Um, so on when you when you look at the traditionalist, the traditionalist has high expectations, um, but is low on relationships. Okay. So for me, the traditionalist is the kind of professor that um, that I saw when I went to a large public um, university. Um, they were paragons in their fields. Um, they had very high expectations of their students. Um, they were not geared to be uh, like friendly to students. So this was in the, the 1980s. Um, they were they were on a on a pedestal that I wanted to reach. That's why I became an academic, right? I was, um, you know, I was enamored with what they knew, um, but there were not people that I could that I could talk talk to and have relationships with. Okay. And so, in the traditionalist view, um, you have very high expectations, um, but you are really not um, going to be interacting a lot with the students. If you're a warm demander, you both have very high expectations, but you also are willing to um, engage with the students as, as human beings. And with that combination of um, high expectations and willing to engage with the students as human beings, um, you can actually increase their engagement in the class and oftentimes the way that you can do it online is just by these turns of phrases that Julian was, um, was talking about, okay? So um, with that, um, why don't we go into a breakout room um, for about um, five minutes? Um, so what I want you to think about um, as you're in the breakout room is where are you in this graphic? You know, do you have high expectations and low relationships? Or um, are you more in the warm demander? Or are you someone who has fairly low expectations um, and, and high relationships? Where are you? Um, so as I put you in the breakout rooms, think about that. And then in the breakout rooms, um, have a discussion about what would communication look like if you had high expectations, and you're willing to engage um, with the students. So again, as I put you in the breakout rooms, it's gonna take a minute, um, think about where are you? And then um, in the breakout rooms, what would communication look like if you were a warm demander? So just a moment, let me put you into those breakout rooms. Okay, I'm opening the rooms and inside the rooms we'll have about five minutes um, to discuss what it would it look like to have high expectations and um, have warm, compassionate communication.
Hello, thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back. It's always a good sign when people don't immediately come back from the break room, um, when they take the maximum amount of time in the breakout room session. Um, so please um, tell me, what did you talk about in your breakout rooms? Well, we, we in our breakout room, we started talking about where we were from. Uh, Oscar asked us, you know, where, where are you located? So we could we could talk about a, a little bit about our, our backgrounds. And um, uh, Miranda had a great question for you, I think, that, that um, I'll let her pose. But we started, you know, getting, we're just, the reason why we're so late coming back is we we're talking about what phrases we use, what strategies we use. And um, yeah. And and Oscar, you did, you did exactly what, uh, what I did at the beginning, right? Connect first. Yeah. Was that intentional? I think it was. Uh, I tend to be uh, uh, that friendly with my students. And I was just sharing with my group also that that seems to be a, a good icebreaker. Uh, whether that's a new, brand new class or a class in between the semester, I'm usually greeting everybody and then greeting John, Peter, uh, depending on how they react. But uh, it puts them at ease um, when, when you do that. That's perfect. That is that is compassionate communication in um, in practice. Maureen, you had a question. It was Marinda. So, oh, Marinda, uh, yep. Um, my question was, and I just had told my group members, I said, I'm just really curious because you had said that you, the reason you went into teaching was because of the examples of the professors that were traditionalists, which obviously by this session, that is not the way that you continue to be a professor. And so I just wanted to know why the shift? What happened um, that made you shift? Um, I think it's, um, I mean, I think it is larger um, social shifts um, over the past 40 years. Um, we're not, we're no longer living in the same places uh, and time and culture as in the 1980s. In the 1980s, um, there were large public universities um, that were like, um, that were affordable and people went to, were able to go to them um, largely independent of what their financial means were, for example. That was the case with me. Um, now we are living in a time and place where education is very expensive. Um, and the students that we have, they really need to um, get something else um, from us than they did in the, than in the 1980s. Um, they need to have student learning outcomes. I work a lot with first generation students. Uh, UNLV is one of the most diverse campuses um, in the nation. And um, the students need something different than they did in the 1980s. Um, thank you for the question. All right, so um, with that, um, so how do you think about traditionalists versus warm demanders? Do you see traditionalists? Do you see warm demanders? Or what strategies um, did you think about in terms of becoming a warm demander? So um, I'm a librarian, so it's um, I teach a lot in other people's classrooms as a guest uh, speaker. And um, it's difficult to build relationships because I may see them once if I'm lucky twice. So I, but I do want to help students. That's why I became a librarian. So just to think about how can I be non-threatening and friendly? Like what would somebody uh, feel more comfortable to reach out after class and say, hey, I need some help. So just to think about, you know, how you react and talk and interact, how that can all impact whether a person will ever reach back out to you. So right. I always think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So um, what could be some strategies? Um, so actually I'll ask Julian, um, like what, um, 
what strategies uh, do you use? Um, because I know that um, you used to be more in the traditionalist mode, like much like me. Um, and so, what was the sh what was the shift? I mean, how how have you shifted how you communicate, or what do you do when you communicate um, with more compassion? Well, one magic phrase that 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 uh, that I learned from you is is really to end the emails. Sometimes it can be hard to figure out how to respond to a to a student e email with a, a detailed problem. So I've and it can take a lot of time, if, especially if you have a large class. So I've I've gotten into the habit now of of replying in a rel relatively briefly, um, and ending with a phrase that 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 is almost a magic phrase. And when I mention it to other people, they 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 seem to to really get excited about it. Um, but it's your phrase that basically says, please let me know how I can help you succeed in class. And what that does is it shows concern, but it also puts the responsibility on the student to get back to you, to take ownership of part of that problem. And for me, that's that was that single phrase, I call it magic in a way, because it really transformed my understanding of how I really should be interacting with students around some of these classes, especially around some of the tougher topics. And the response I've got from students, I, if I could go back and do an experiment where I was doing A-B testing before I used that phrase and afterwards, I think there would be a really big difference in the responses, quite frankly. Um, so I don't wanna to put too much into the actual specific words, but it's really the, the attitude about using that type of phrase that says, please, you tell me how I can help you. So it's, it's, it's that idea of we're working together, but you're the one who has to take the lead on helping me understand why you're not able to, to do this part of the class or why things are not working out. Um, and often the students respond with basically, no, I just need to study more and they take ownership or they tell me, you know, could you tell me a little bit more about this issue or it'd really help if you did a video on this topic, you have some other videos in the class, but but this one is really confusing. So that single phrase really changed the relationship there. I have to be careful not to overuse it now because it's, it's worked out so well for me. Yeah, um, yeah so what, it's, what it does, it sets up that, that interaction, right? Um, and the opening, the invitation um, for discussions about like how the course could be better or an understanding of, oh, yes, you know, I have to put more time and, and effort into, into the interaction. Marinda, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, I figured I'd really do it since we have our videos on. Um, I, I love that phrase too. And I have found that not only does that work with um, students, but it works with colleagues as well. Uh, we're really, you're letting them know that you, you want to be collaborative you want to assist them, but um, I think it opens, if we're you know, using your word of warm demanders, it kind of works the same with colleagues as well, not just our students as, as we interact. And, and that was something in, that actually drew me to yours. Um, your session was in, in your description because I really, have, we're a smaller department. There's only a total of 17 in our department. So there's not a lot of, of us, but we have been so connected, but disconnected at the same time. So I'm in an awful lot of Zoom meetings. And like you said, you, we miss the, the, the body language, right? I was in a highly, highly charged, it was a small committee of, of six of us. There were tears, there was like, it was so overwhelmingly charged. And, and the one that was so upset, she took her video off. And I just said, I, I want you to know that there is nothing wrong with being upset right now. It's a difficult time. I said, I really wish that you would put your video back on. Again, try to invite, not like put your video back on. Um, and, and she was like, I was blowing my nose. It was ugly, you know? And I said, it's okay. We're here to make it through the mess together. Good, bad, or ugly. We need each other at this moment. And, and where I think before in a meeting, if we were face to face, you would have been able to kind of read that body language a little bit better. And she wouldn't have been able just to put it away. Right. But to us, it was something that we would never have accomplished face to face, which was really interesting, right? Because there's so much disconnection, it seems when we're on these zooms. But just being able for us to express that to one another, 
the end of that meeting was, was uh, the only word I can think of is beautiful because it would not have happened any other time. And it was because there was empathy because there was compassion and, and, um, and, and that's what really drew me to this, this particular session of yours. And, and I'm not disappointed at all. I, I, I have been learning those things, but I think that that, that had just happened this week was, was something that really brought me, really wanted me to join this session as well. So thank you for sharing your, your knowledge. So what you what you talked about is uh, would be an additional message if if we had more time, and that is, conflict is part of life. Uh, it's bound to happen whenever two plus people work together, but working through conflict in an empathetic, compassionate way, like what what you what you did uh, for your colleague by reaching out, by letting her breathe. Um, and by breathing yourself through the conflict, um, that made all the difference. And at the end, by working through conflict compassionately, you can actually create stronger relationships, better working relationships. And that's the same whether it's in your classes when you have a conflict or tensions with a student because they're not fulfilling your expectations, you reaching out, and using that magic phrase that Julian was talking about, mm -hmm. um, that helps build a positive relationship and the kind of empathy and compassion. I vow interaction mm -hmm. that can then build the relationships that will make things better for everyone in the virtual or physical room. And so and that I kind of uh, debris, thank you. I, I, one phrase I that might help as well in this discussion is I would kind of unpacked it with a, a, my department chair actually. And the words he used will stick with me. So kind of like Julian has the magic phrase. Normally we would step away from conflict, right? Like everyone would just shut down. But he used the words, we leaned into the mess. And that has really changed me. So even, you know, with talking with our students, it will get messy. But if I'm willing to lean into it, generally they'll lean back in, right? But if I'm just like, eh, sucks to be you, right? And then I'm out. There is, that's the end of it, right? There, there's no further learning that goes. And so I really love that. It's okay to lean into the mess. So that really helped me as well. Thank Great. you. That's, yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah, go ahead. Jordan. I just wanted to say that, that when I use the phrase, the, the word magic phrase, um, I, I, what I'm doing is I'm not, it's not something that I want to use too often and repeat because that it's, it's absolutely crucial to be authentic, right? For me, it's almost like a mantra because it reminds myself of the, of the way of interacting. Sometimes when I get lost or a little bit stressed or we, we have to wrap things up because it's the end of class or the, the session. But for me, it's a reminder to myself as well um, and to, to try and sort of replicate it and be be as compassionate and authentic as possible uh, but again it's a, it's a new strategy for many of us and we're we are coming at it from different angles i'm really impressed that your chair um was looking at it that way miranda because that's um it's it's important for administrators to to be completely on board with with this way of communication during this time um we're a lot of people coming from different perspectives and uh, we're having to develop new ways to communicate and new norms it's it's a challenge so thanks a lot. I really enjoyed this session, Ivana. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Julian, 